Good morning, fellowship, and, and all of you, and then all of you that are joining uh, online as well. Either way, it's just great to be together on a beautiful, unique COVID Labor Day weekend. Um, again, if, if we haven't met, I'm Dave Chittick, and I love serving with a great group of guys on the Elder Board. Today, we're wrapping up Ain't No Fool. It's our summer series on Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived in his book of Proverbs, which is known as one of the wisdom books in the Bible. All summer, we've been digging into Solomon's words about what wisdom truly is, justice, guarding our hearts, choosing forgiveness, living a generous life, and and a whole lot more. And I don't know about you, but um, but it, it kills me that as a young man, I didn't read Proverbs. Because I think my life, my life would have been dramatically less foolish if I had. And in fact, wisdom is something that I felt like my wife Linda and I needed years ago as a family. Our family started growing. We had three really high energy young men, um, Ginny, think of three Noahs, under the age of 10, trying to mold them into gentlemen. We're battling them over homework. We're scrambling to get them to church. We're already running all over the place for sports. And it was awesome, but at some level, it was chaos. And we just weren't really aligned about what the priorities were in our lives. And the result was that we needed a vision for our family, but we didn't yet have it. So today, we're going to take a look at vision in the tale in the Proverbs, and we're also going to dig into the rest of the story of Solomon's life because it is a powerful cautionary tale for us. Now, you might not be aware, but the last two chapters, Proverbs 30 and 31, are attributed to other writers. So chapter 29 has Solomon's final thoughts in Proverbs, and in it he writes to the wise, to fools, to the bloodthirsty, to rulers, to children, to the poor. And I think uh, those are pretty much the guys that, that hang out in our men's group, but, but really there's something in there for everybody, right? And and one verse stands out, and it's well known, especially in the King James Version of the Bible, and that's verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Now, those were powerful words thousands of years ago, and they're just as powerful today, and they bring up the question we're going to dig into this morning. Do you have a vision for your life? for your family's life. The word vision is a Hebrew word, chazon, and we were with Pastor Matt, we were talking not, not shazam, not calzone, chazon, which means revelation. And, and that's God revealing his word through, um, in, in Solomon's day, it would have been through revelation, through the Hebrew, Hebrew scriptures of the people that God had spoken to. So Abraham... Moses, David, for example. Today, we have all of God's revelation, right? We have the entire Bible, and the words of Jesus, preaching the word in church even, is revelation. So Solomon's saying that where there is no vision, there's no revelation of God, no biblical teaching, the people are in big trouble. They perish, and that's the Hebrew word para, which means to, to be let loose, so you can see how other versions of the Bible put Paris as cast off restraint, break loose, or run wild. So think about a break in a fence at a farm and the cattle run through it. They stampede, they destroy property. Some of them get trampled in the process. That's kind of a good visual image, image of perishing. And all we have to do is look at the world around us and we, we can see a world without God's biblical vision and what's happening. It is running wild. It is running amok. But those that keep the law, that heed wisdom's instruction, which which just means living as Scripture tells us to live, those people are going to be happy, which is also translated as joyful and blessed. So it's pretty clear. 
Learn God's vision, follow it, and you'll be blessed. No vision, life start coming unhinged. In my mind, too, it brings up a question. Did Solomon have a vision for his life? I mean, we've been digging into his words all summer. This great strong guidance is just as powerful today as it was 3,000 years ago from the wisest human who ever lived. And he was incredibly successful for a period of time. But I don't think we can wrap up this series and put a bow on it until we learn the rest of Solomon's story. Now, story is a big thing in the Chittick family because my son and his wife, they're writers and editors in the world of comic books and graphic novels, which is a really interesting business. And, and one of the story concepts that they're obsessed with as creators is something called the character arc. So that's any lead character's journey through the story and how that individual changes and grows as a result of what's happening to that person in the narrative. You know, typically it's a lead character will start weak and naive and broken through trials and challenges, matures and grows and becomes a better, stronger person um, and often a big hero. It, biblically, think of Joseph or Moses or David. In the comic book world, think of little Brucey e. Wayne. So he's hanging out being a rich kid. His parents get shot right in front of him. Uh, totally changed his wife, he, life. He swore on his parents' grave he'd avenge their death. Um, he goes out, he works out, he gets in good shape. He goes car and cape shopping. Picked up a little fixer-upper cave and became the hero Batman that we know today. Character arc. So let's take a look at the story of Solomon's character arc. He's King David's son, and after some crazy family drama, David dies, and Solomon becomes king at only 15 years old. And is told in 1 Kings 3, starting in verse 5, God appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. This morning I was thinking, what, a, what would I have asked as a 15-year-old? Not what Solomon's going to ask for. Solomon replied, God, you have made me king, but I'm like a little child who doesn't know his way around. Please give me an understanding heart so I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. So the Lord was pleased. God replied, because you've asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice and have not asked for long life or wealth, I'll give you what you ask for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart such as no one else has ever had or will ever have. That's why we know he was the wisest man that ever lived and will ever live. So Solomon's character arc rose from being this naive, callow 15-year-old to becoming this multi-talented superstar leader. He makes Elon Musk look like a loser. He rebuilt cities, he grew trade, he was an expert in botany and biology. He built the temple, which after hundreds of years was finally the first permanent home of worship for the Jewish nation. He was a more, pro more prolific mu musician than Adele. He wrote, according to the Bible, 1,005 songs. He was a writer. He was a poet. In addition to the book of Proverbs, he also wrote Song of Solomon. Talk about a graphic novel. Um, we're not going to break that down today. But if you're married and you haven't read it, read it with your spouse and then you can thank me later. So, the story of Solomon's character arc, it just kept rising. Read First Kings. I mean, it's really an interesting story until he crashed. Did you know that about Solomon? Complete. Was it arrogance, hubris, maybe just boredom of having everything he'd ever desired I'd argue that Solomon, this great champion of wisdom, a man to whom God spoke directly, he turned his back on God and ultimately did not have a vision for his life. And the consequences were disastrous, as it often is for us when we don't have a vision, because it's not just us, but it's our families, our coworkers that are impacted. God laid down rules in Deuteronomy 17 that a Jewish king was not supposed to rack up horses, wives, or money. Yet Solomon collected 12,000 horses. He made himself the richest man on earth, and God specifically said 
that having multiple wives would lead a ruler's heart astray from God. And yet Solomon completely ignored his own wisdom on guarding the heart. It's the most important thing we can do, right? We, we spent a whole Sunday morning on that. And he ended up with 700 wives, 300 concubines. For the record, for a lot of reasons I align with scripture, I recommend one spouse is the right number, and it's plenty. 1 Kings 11 says that, in fact, those wives did lead him astray. He built temples to the idols his wives worship, idols that God called abominations. And you see exactly as Solomon predicted. He himself turned from God's word, from God's vision. He cast off restraint, and he became perishing, or he began perishing. Because in 1 Kings 11, we see that starting in verse 9, the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel who commanded that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, since you've not kept my covenant and my statutes that I've commanded, I will surely tear the kingdom from you. So one slide ago, he's talking to God, and one slide later, everything's getting ready to fall apart. There are consequences to all of us to living life without a godly vision. In Solomon's case, the consequences were to the nation of Israel. After Solomon died, the kingdom split, which was the beginning of the end for Israel. The northern kingdom was eventually conquered by the Assyrians, the southern kingdom, because they became decadent and leaderless, they were conquered by the Babylonians. And the very temple that Solomon had so lovingly built, specifically to God's commands, was destroyed. And Israel went off to captivity. And by the way, Solomon knew that he blew it. He became so disillusioned, he actually wrote one other book. Did you know that? He wrote Ecclesiastes, where the name or where the theme is basically that everything under the sun is meaningless. So this man that had everything because he lost God's vision and ended up finding life hollow and empty. It's crazy. It's crazy to me. All that wisdom, I'm thinking, what can we, we're not as smart, we're not as wise as Solomon, what can we learn from the, from the wisest man's failure? All right, well, you have got, we all have got to have a vision for ourselves and our family based on God's vision, the revelation of Scripture, just as Solomon noted in Proverbs 29, 18. It is one of the most important things that we can do as Christians, regardless of our age. You know, I talked about our family was, was kind of getting chaotic. In our case all those years ago, as life got crazier and more out of control, Linda and I, my wife, both sensed that we needed a vision that would guide all of us in the, in the family, us and the boys. So we discussed creating a family mission statement. Our vision for how to live our lives together as a Christian family, a lodestone for making decisions in life. And I mean, I thought about it, and I probably prayed a little bit about it because I didn't pray nearly enough in those days. And this is, I actually dug this up. This is my folder of the family mission statement. And these were notes and things that I read, and I finally... I came up with this 200 word salad thing with things like, do our best, never stop learning. So I presented it to Linda and uh, she took one look and, and metaphorically said, are you kidding me? So, and I don't, husbands, if you've ever been there, you think you have a great idea, take it to your wife, she shoots you down because maybe it wasn't such a great idea. That was not a great idea. But Linda, who had always been a prayer warrior, she laid down the family vision, which became these four simple words. And they are faith, family, education, and service. Does that sound familiar? It should because faith, family, and service are at the heart of our Live for More mission here at Fellowship. Linda just happened to be 25 years ahead of the curve on that. But the reality is that simple vision, it changed our lives. Is out of the chaos, we now had direction. We now had alignment. 
we had something we could all point to is we made decisions to prioritize God, family, school, and service. Sleep in or head to church on Sunday? Church. Watch TV or do homework? Homework. Hang out with friends or the grandparents? Grandparents. Have another glass of wine or go home in moderation? Go home. And so, I mean, after a while, it really became how all five of us rolled as a family. And think about it, just four God-inspired words. So I think for all of us, there's a simplicity and clarity there, and we all can do that. So here's the question. What is God's vision for your life? George Barnard, the Christian survey guru, defines vision as the clear mental image of the preferable future imparted by God to his chosen servants based about an accurate understanding of God, self, and circumstances. In essence, it's your future from God. In his book, Chazon, Discovering and Pursuing God's Purpose for Your Life, Pastor Craig Rochelle, he's head of Life Church, lays out a plan to find your God-directed vision. Simplified the steps of these, and they're not rocket science. One, ask the Lord for guidance. Pray hard for a vision. It's what Joseph, Moses, David, Jesus always did. After praying, dig into Scripture. Write down those, those verses, those key words, those teaching of Jesus that the Lord brings to you, and then meditate on those for a period of time. Discuss them with your family, with your spouse. Groeschel says to think about which words positively impact your relationship with God, others, your work, your health, even your financial health. And after praying and meditating on what God has shown you, finalize those words and be at peace with the direction that God wants for your life. And make those words God's chazone for your life. Pastor Joe's vision is... uh, So uh, Pastor Joe's out there camping. I hope you guys are having a great time. Pastor Joe's vision is owned by God. He's so serious, it's tatted right on his ankle right here. Keep an eye open for it when he's got shorts on. Youth Pastor Jeff's family vision is faith, honor, unity, generosity, passion, creativity. With two more words in our family, you know, the Davidsons are clearly overachievers. But you talk to Pastor Jeff, and as they make decisions in life, they, they fall under these God-directed words. And then, right, comes the challenging part. Guarding your heart and living that vision every day of your life in a broken world. Keeping the story of your character arc always rising, rising unlike our guy Solomon. It's really hard, fellowship, but there is a richness to following God's vision for your life. And frankly, after you make a few tough decisions that align with your vision, with God's plan, you survive the consequences of those, de- those decisions and find that the Holy Spirit is growing his power in you and your family, it gets easier and easier to make the next tough decisions. In fact, God strengthens you and your heart in the process. In Ephesians 3, 16 to 17, Paul says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Christ in your heart, that helps guard your heart, right? And and I don't think I need to say why having a vision that you stick to is so important right now more than ever. In the time of COVID, even more in recent years, right, people are losing God's vision. And they are perishing. And you you, you probably know this, families are falling apart. Divorce is rising, alcohol and substance abuse are way up, and people are drifting away from the church. In fact, Barna surveys are showing that some 40% of people are falling away from the church. And I will tell you, that is, that is mostly millennials and younger people. I mean, a lot of people right now, without a vision, without a rock-solid faith, they're pulling a Solomon. So 
with what's going on in this world, God's vision is clearly important to us as a church. And as, you know, as Aaron said, next week is Vision Sunday. And I just want you to know that at Fellowship, we are going to persevere in being a church that is based on God's revelation. We preach from this Bible every single week. And whether the message is the, is the Old Testament or the New, ultimately we in this church body will stay f- steadfast in trusting that this is the one unified story and that's the story of the most perfect character arc that of Jesus Christ amen who lived a servant's life was crucified buried rose from the dead to offer salvation to each and every one of us here online in our extended church family right and all who believe in him COVID ain't stopping that people God continues building this church. You're going to hear next week about the powerful things that are happening. The gates of Hades are not going to prevail against this church. There is no way. So be sure to join us next Sunday for Vision Sunday, 10 o'clock, to hear how our church is going to even better support you and your families, how we're going to be better connected, and we're going to learn God's word even better and deeper. Fellowship, as we close today, I'm, it still really rattles me that lack of vision ruined almost all of Solomon's life work. But I can tell you that for my family, getting that, that, that simple, godly-led vision was a lifesaver that improved each one of the character arcs in our family. By living that simple vision of faith, family, education and service. The Lord led us from a previous church of 15 years here to fellowship, completely changed the faith journey of every one of us for the better as we started to hear God's word spoken every single Sunday. It meant a commitment to family that's now spread across four states and two continents. Includes our sons, their families, our two Kenyan sons, their mother and sister in Nairobi. And after deep and long prayer, it it led to a lot of sacrifices that we ended up sending our kids to a boys' school that it was just the right place for their learning styles. And it was a change that led to completely different careers, dramatically changed their lives. But it's, it's led to amazing lives for our sons, two wonderful women of faith as wives. And if you see the way their lives have played out, it's exactly, they're exactly where God wanted them because we followed his vision for us. There's a lot more stories that I could tell you, don't get me wrong. Um, We still made plenty of foolish choices and foolish decisions, but identifying and following God's vision because that's what he wanted for our family, that was a complete game changer. Fellowship, what is your vision for your life? Or if you have it, if you have those words written down, are you following it? What is that north star of your Christian faith, that vision that you're going to follow unwaveringly? I promise you, absolutely, if you take the time to prayerfully, biblically craft that vision and persevere in sticking to it, in the years to come, that all of the ideas we studied this summer in Proverbs, they're just going to fall into place. Living with wisdom, guarding your hearts, choosing forgiveness, living generously, speaking wise and kind words. And your story, your character arc, will be miles ahead of the wisest man that ever lived. And despite what's happening in this broken world, you won't perish. You will be joyful joyful and happy and blessed as you live the life that God wants you to live. Fellowship, let's pray real quickly. Father God, I just, I'm so thankful that we can gather as a church family, whether we're here, it's here or virtually. I give thanks for all that you are doing in, in our lives of each of us in this fellowship family. And I just pray that we would learn from Solomon. You would give each of us the vision that you want for our lives, that we would stick to it. We would, we would stick to it with your son Jesus as our North Star. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Fellowship, God bless. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. And um, see you next Sunday, Vision Sunday. Thank you.